Welcome to Wider View, the program that provides perspectives on the news outside the narrow confines of the mainstream media. I'm your host, Charles Dunaway. Well, it's those narrow confines that I believe we need to talk about today. The very restricted range of opinions and ideas permitted in our media and their efforts to engage us all in fighting over nuances within that range. One of the roles of mainstream media is to convince us to believe narratives that justify imperialism, restrictions on free speech, and the neoliberal economic policies that impoverish us. Australian journalist Caitlin Johnstone provides some examples in a recent article where she says, quote, A new Gallup poll finds that Americans' opinion of Russia and China have plummeted to historic lows this year, with 79% of the population now reporting an unfavorable view of China and 77% reporting an unfavorable view of Russia. In a recent Mint Press News article titled, After Years of Propaganda, American Views of Russia and China Hit Historic Lows, Alan McLeod points the finger at the obvious culprit in this shift in public opinion. He says, last year, American military planners advised that the U.S. should step up its campaign of psychological warfare against Beijing including sponsoring authors and artists to create anti-China propaganda. The Pentagon's budget request for 2021 makes clear that the United States is retooling for a potential intercontinental war with China or Russia. It's asking for $705 billion to shift focus from the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and a greater emphasis on the types of weapons that could be used to confront nuclear giants like Russia and China. Noting that it requires more advanced high-end weapon systems, which provide increased standoff, enhanced lethality, and autonomous targeting for employment against near-peer threats in a more contested environment. Uh, Parenthetically, you should read that as we want to give a tremendous amount of taxpayer money to the defense industry uh, to build these weapons, of course, um, with, with open, no budget limitation. To return to, uh, to Alan McLeod's article, Russia, meanwhile, has been the focus of Democratic Party ire since their defeat in the 2016 election. Prominent Democrats have accused Vladimir Putin of being behind the rise of Bernie Sanders, of paying Afghans to kill American soldiers, and of helping spark the January 6th insurrection on the Capitol building in Washington. Russiagate, the belief that Moscow managed to hack the 2016 election, swinging the result for Trump, has hardened liberal attitudes toward the country and drastically increased suspicion and fear of Russians. This was crystallized by former Director of National Intelligence James Clapper's comments on NBC Meet the Press, where he claimed that the Russians are, quote, typically almost genetically driven to co-opt, penetrate, and gain favor, end quote. Substitute anything else for Russians, and you see what a racist comment that is. As with China, the U.S. government has attempted to score diplomatic points, taking up the case of imprisoned politician Alexei Navalny, for example. Johnstone continues, there is no rational reason for anyone to hold particularly negative views of either of these countries based on actual facts and evidence, and there is certainly no rational reason to perceive them as a threat. The idea that China or Russia pose a threat to you is so self-evidently ridiculous, so transparently absurd, that the only way to make you believe it would be to propagandize you. And if you do believe it, that's exactly what's happened. You can expand this principle to include the entirety of U.S. foreign policy on the global stage today. No ordinary American benefits from the U.S. having troops in Syria, sanctioning Venezuelans to death, supporting Saudi Arabia while it rapes Yemen, circling the planet with military bases and working to destroy any nation which refuses to bow to its dictates. The only way to get Americans to consent to any of these agendas is to propagandize them into doing so. 
And that's the end of a very long quote from uh, Caitlin Johnstone. I found it extremely disturbing that so many progressives have fallen for the negative propaganda against Russia and China. That propaganda only exists to enlist your support for more military spending and eventually a war that could destroy mankind. And when you allow yourself to believe these lies, then you will be ready to accept whatever new provocation, sanctions, or military actions a Democratic president tells you are needed. Now, of course, you'll, you'll still oppose uh, those actions when they're done by a Republican, usually. It's not just the mainstream media, though, that's propagandizing us. Social media is a major target of those who want to control our opinions. Listen to this excerpt from a recent podcast interview of Army Major Jessica Dawson, Ph.D. Dawson is a research scientist at the Army Cyber Institute at West Point. She recently published a paper entitled Micro-Targeting as Information Warfare. I think you'll find some of this in enlightening. When we look at the social media space, there isn't anybody really in charge. There's no regulation over this data in many ways. And so we're really at the whims of the social media companies to do anything in this space. The problem with that is that we are not really recognizing the way that this space can be weaponized, either by normal actors who are just seeking to get a rise out of folks and go and go viral, out of domestic actors who are seeking to use this space for power and, and possibly profit, and by foreign actors who are seeking to erode the United States from within. All of those things happen on these platforms, and there's no regulation on any of them. And so it, it's a pretty big threat space that I think we're just now starting to, to wake up to inside of the DOD. Well, social media as a threat space. Leave it to the DOD to come up with that. But the thing about regulation, I think, is not a bad idea. But you have to think about who is doing the regulating and why are they doing it. When you start talking about uh, political ads and political ideas or memes being somehow controlled on social media. I mean, you obviously have to ask the question, who's controlling them and why? Facebook, for example, has uh, announced, <clears throat> in the, you know, due to all of the uh, uh, accusations that were raised against it uh, having to do with Russiagate, they've announced that they are doing a lot more uh, reviewing and curtailing of uh, political advertising and political posts and pages than they were doing earlier. So who's helping them do this? Well, the Atlantic Council is helping them do this. The Atlantic Council is basically a, an arm of NATO, a think tank that is uh, under the auspices of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. So it is an establishment uh, voice, one that is pro-military, pro-war, uh, and pro-neoliberal uh, ideology. So they are going to curtail anything that does not uh, agree with their view of how things ought to be in, in the United States. Dawson's last comment about uh, the effect of these potentially dangerous memes on the troops. Uh, she explains a little further on in the interview, uh, and I think you can see how this could be a serious problem uh, for those of us on the left who uh, dissent. When we think about, you know, the, the messaging around this, this election, the previous election, right? If you have a segment of the force that believes that the president is illegitimate, well, that's a problem for following the orders of the office of the president, right? The president is the commander in chief. So that fundamentally undermines chain of command and, and command authority. And, and this is not a new phenomenon, right? We have had, you know, people have been questioning the legitimacy of the president since, you know, since Bush v. Gore, right? So this mm -hmm. is not something that social media has, has started, but it has certainly amplified it. And when you're in these spaces that reinforce the perspective that you already have and reinforce these 
for lack of a better term, tribal boundaries, it can really cause problems inside the force in terms of unit cohesion and the ability to function as, as a team. So anything that might undermine uh, the legitimacy of the president as commander-in-chief of the military, of course, is going to have this negative effect on the morale of the troops and might uh, give them second thoughts about whether they want to follow all of the orders given to them um, by that commander-in-chief. Uh, and yes, I mean, if you want to consider presidents Ill illegitimate, I think that you are quite uh, correct in doing so because they are not democratically elected, you know, because of the parties being controlled, you know, by the corporate interest. In another uh, part of the interview, Dawson refers to social media as a cognitive space, which I think is quite uh, telling because it is a place where Americans think, or if it's more precise, we can think for them. Uh, you know, they, they see Americans really as dupes who cannot uh, judge for themselves whether things are true or not true, or, or what the motivations behind various stories could be, and that's probably a true thing. They want to make sure that everything is controlled so that there's tight regulation by the federal government to ensure that nothing falls outside the acceptable spectrum. Here's one more clip from Major Dawson. We really have to think about what are we going to allow to be advertised? We do this all the time. We've done this with cigarettes. We've done this with alcohol. We do this with, with other products. So it's time to really have, have a, a national discussion about what are we going to allow to be advertised? and really come up with how do we protect the civic sphere? Protect the civic sphere. Yes, we must protect the civic sphere from the people. I think when you think about the implications of what Major Dawson is suggesting, it's really chilly. Uh, so, for example, the they might not allow you to advertise your anti-war event unless it's passed on by some government regulator who will determine whether it might undermine authority um, uh, and uh, damage the troops' morale. We need to end this bickering between the right and the left and let the federal government decide who can speak and who cannot. That's exactly what is going on right now in Washington. The Democrats are trying to convince us that Trump's followers are terrorists and they're undermining our democracy and we have to clamp down on social media because they are using it to propagate QAnon conspiracy theories and organize right-wing protests and insurrections. Now, you should understand that this anti-Trump rationale is designed to get you to agree to restricting speech on the Internet. And once they have that restriction in place, you can bet your life that it'll be used on anti-war, Black Lives Matter, and other dissidents on the left. <clears throat> First, they convince you that Russia, some other so-called bad actor, is using social media to interfere with the election or in some other pretext. Then they use that to increase U.S. control of social media use by American citizens. In other words, they can now eliminate the possibility that you can hear an alternative voice that might challenge government propaganda. Social media isn't the only uh, way the government is interfering. You probably noticed that a lot of applications require location data for one reason or another. Others like Facebook and Google automatically collect your location data unless you opt out in some complex way that's never publicized. But you're probably also aware that this location data, basically every place you go, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, is sold to advertisers. But it's likely also that it's sold to the federal government. Vox reported recently that a new Treasury Department Inspector General report says it doesn't believe agencies have the legal right to buy location data from commercial services without obtaining a warrant. The watchdog had been investigating the Internal Revenue Service for doing just that, but the IRS isn't the only agency that buys location data on the open market. The military, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Drug Enforcement Administration, and the Department of Homeland Security do it too. 
The agencies have said they aren't doing anything illegal since they're simply buying commercially available data supplied by users who consented to that data to be collected. Fox's Sarah Morrison goes on to say that last November, Vice managed to chase one trail, reporting that a location data company called Xmode was selling the data obtained through its software development kit, which is in the apps, hundreds of apps with millions of users, to defense contractors, selling the data to defense contractors. The contractors then sold that data to the military. Senator Wyden of Oregon has been on a parallel quest to investigate these so-called data brokers and has reached a similar conclusion around the same time. Wyden is planning to introduce something he calls the Fourth Amendment is Not for Sale Act that will require the government to get a warrant for personal information on citizens. And if there were enough libertarian Republicans to override the blue dog Democrats and the Democrats have the guts to eliminate the filibuster, that bill might pass. Two very big ifs, of course. The role of the mainstream media in suppressing dissent and manufacturing consent for the U.S. empire is sometimes underestimated. And here is um, an audio clip of Australian journalist Caitlin Johnston discussing the methods the media use to retain narrative control. You might also know I'm really fond of saying that those who control the narrative control the world. And I'm fond of saying that not just because it's true, but also because it points to the solution as well as the problem. When you truly see that whoever controls the narrative controls the world, you can easily zero in on the inherent weakness in their power structure. And that weakness is that it is all reliant on belief in their stories. So when you attack their stories, when you shine truth on their lies, you are attacking their power base because you can't do horrible things to people and to our planet without gaslighting the public into consenting for them. If they let people make up their own minds about their actions, then the people would instantly stop them doing all those horrible things. They must control the story about what they're doing, and that's usually by manipulating our sense of right and wrong and by distorting and obfuscating abuses of power. So, as a journalist, obviously there are many, 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 many bad things happening in the world today, and all are equally deserving of attention. But for me... Few of them are as useful at pointing directly to the underlying power structure while highlighting its key strategies and outlining its weaknesses and also showing people how to actually use the tool, which we must use to fight them, as is the example of Julian Assange. When Assange started WikiLeaks, he did so on the premise that corrupt and unaccountable power is a problem in our world and that that problem can be fought with the light of truth. And what did corrupt and unaccountable power do? It responded right on cue by detaining, silencing and controlling the narrative about him by smearing him until the outcry about his detention was significantly muted. So as powerful as the leaks are, it's not simply each publication of WikiLeaks that highlights the machinations of corrupt power. It's also the fact that the very existence of WikiLeaks and Julian Assange has created a situation where power has had to overextend itself and it's using all its tricks right out there in the open in order to try and shut WikiLeaks down. Because ideally, inverted totalitarian power likes to work in its dark magic behind the scenes by doing what they like and pacing a compliant population into supporting it. But by watching who attempts to shut Assange down and how they do it, we are gathering a working picture of how power maintains control of the population through the matrix of narrative control. We can easily see that anyone who offends the U.S. centralised empire will find themselves subject to trial by media because the media are owned by the same plutocratic class which owns the empire. So to believe what the mass media news outlets tell you about those who stand up to imperial power is to ignore reality. 
If our news outlets were sincerely doing their job as the fourth estate, they would be reporting on the persecution of Julian Assange in the same way they report on the persecution of any dissident journalist. But they don't. That, in and of itself, speaks volumes. The media don't just stand silently by either. They smear him. They use half-truths, exaggerations, outright lies to build a picture of him as a stinky, Nazi, cat-torturing, rapist, Russian spy. And it's remarkable how consistent this characterization is across almost all these seemingly independent outlets. That's because corrupt and unaccountable power uses its political and media influence to smear Assange because, as far as the interests of corrupt and unaccountable power are concerned, killing his reputation is as good as killing him. What Caitlin Johnstone says about media smearing of Julian Assange is a pattern that's repeated daily in the Western press. Look, for example, at the U.S. media's reporting on China. We hear a lot about the repression of the Uyghur population in the Xinjiang region by the Chinese government, but nothing about U.S. support for the Uyghur separatists who have carried out terrorist attacks in that region. We hear a lot about alleged Chinese repression of the people of Hong Kong or their alleged delays in providing information on the COVID-19 pandemic, but we don't hear that China has completely eliminated extreme poverty. In 2013, there were 80 million Chinese in 832 counties living in extreme poverty, and now there are none. We don't hear much about that. We also don't hear much about China's unparalleled success in controlling the pandemic and being able to lift restrictions. In Wuhan, where China's first cases were identified, the lockdown lasted 76 days. We're going on a year now, here. In China, some 4,900 people died from COVID-19, and in the U.S., the total is currently over 522,000. While China is accused of many things in the Western press, such as creating the pandemic, stealing American manufacturing jobs, posing a threat in the South China Sea and elsewhere, there's one overpowering reason why China has been designated an enemy. Their economic model, socialism with Chinese characteristics, is working far better than global capitalism. They are creating more billionaires, lifting more people out of poverty, and creating products that will be essential to the planet's future, such as solar arrays and electric cars. The powers that be in this country are deathly afraid that some other nation will demonstrate to the world that the U.S. model of a fake democracy run by global capital is not the best possible system. That's why the U.S. attacked the Soviet Union in 1918, not long after the revolution. They were afraid that communism might turn out to be a viable alternative system, so it had to be destroyed. In recent years, the U.S. has been working overtime to destroy the handful of socialist governments that sprouted up in Latin America. They were making good progress in alleviating poverty in their nations by insisting that the profits from their nation's resources went to help their people rather than line the pockets of Western bankers. These glimmers of hope for the masses in poverty in South America were snuffed out in Brazil, Argentina, and Ecuador, and the remaining socialist democracies are under attack in Venezuela, Bolivia, and Nicaragua. Putting the welfare of the common people above the profits of the elite, particularly the U.S. elite, is the opposite of the neoliberal ideology that drives Western global finance capitalism. Nations that hold free and fair elections open to all parties often elect socialists who want to nationalize industries that are currently in the hands of a few rich families with ties to the United States. The U.S. media will then call those elected elected leaders dictators, and they'll clamor for a return to democracy. But the democracy they want is the kind we have here in the land of the free and the home of the brave, a democracy in which a wealthy elite control both political parties so they will serve the corporations and banks rather than the people. 
There are a couple of narratives that I think I would urge you to be suspicious about whenever you hear them. When you hear negative reports about a nation the U.S. is designated as an enemy, you need to be very suspicious. Human rights issues are often used to create popular animosity towards the nation or its leader in order to justify regime change, more military spending, or more crippling sanctions. That's not to say that human rights are perfectly free in China, Iran, or Syria. However, it is important to remember that the United States government barely cares about the human rights of its own people and certainly doesn't care about the human rights abuses elsewhere. They're using that narrative to get you to support their policy against that country. And when you hear glowing articles in the Democratic-aligned media about the success of Democrats and how they really want to help the people and are really trying to do it, you should be very suspicious. Likewise, the conservative media, when they extol the righteousness of the Republicans, and, and most of you would find that suspicious, if not outright fraudulent. It's important to realize that both sides, MSNBC and Fox News, share certain basic assumptions and are there to create a lively debate to sell ads and not present the truth to the people. I think Noam Chomsky probably explained this best. Well, outside of that debate between those who say the press is too adversarial and must be curbed and those who say, well, yes, the press is cantankerous and impossible, but we just have to suffer that in the interest of freedom. Uh, outside the spectrum of that debate, which constitutes virtually the entire mainstream discussion, virtually the entire discussion, but outside the debate, there is another position. Uh, the other position challenges the factual assumption that's taken for granted in the debate. According to this alternative view, the media do indeed fulfill a societal purpose, but a very different one. Their societal purpose is to inculcate and defend the economic and social and political agenda of the privileged groups that dominate the domestic society. And they do this in all sorts of ways. They do it by selection of topics, by distribution of concern, by the way they frame issues, by filtering of information, uh, by emphasis and tone, by simple fabrication sometimes but crucially by the bounding of debate to make sure that it doesn't go outside of certain limits. Uh, the bounding both in the news columns and in the opinion columns, because of course the news columns themselves embody all sorts of assumptions and ideological presuppositions and so on. Uh, to the, according to this alternative view, to the extent that there is a liberal bias, uh, it serves primarily to bound thinkable thought. Uh, that is to instill the unchallengeable assumptions uh, which in fact reflect this rather narrow elite consensus. So the liberal bias performs a real function. It says thus far and no further. I'm as far as you can go, and I go as far, how, uh, how far I go is still accepting the basic presuppositions as unchallengeable. I think we'll let uh, Professor Chomsky have the last word here today. As always, the views expressed on my review are those of myself and my guests and may not reflect the views of the management of this radio station. I'm your host, Charles Dunaway. Thank you for listening to Wider View.